so much data that I've got to go through and been compiling from everything that's been going on with Crypto Rush. Uh, it's been crazy. So, um, you know, before we kind of uh, get started, I want to give you guys like uh, more or less a little bit of background about, I guess, who I am. You know, I'm King Dragon. Uh, professionally, what I do for a living is, you know, I hack. Um, I'm a software developer. That's kind of where I started. So it's kind of nice because um, it kind of helps inner working wise. But I don't do too much on the hardware side, but um, stick more towards software. Um, I've worked with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, and uh, I think it's pretty cool that I can tell people that um, I've actually had a lot of my work, or I show that stuff to kind of like generals and ambassadors. Um, so it's kind of cool, yeah. So all right, um, next, I hope for is who, how many people in here have actually heard of digital currencies before? Okay, who in here has heard of Bitcoin that actually hadn't already raised their hand? Okay, it's hard to tell, but okay. All right, so in short, um, for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with Bitcoin or digital currencies, um, in short, it's a currency, uh, unlike fiat currencies like US dollars, that's designed um, so it's not centralized. So what this looks like is if standard, you go into a bank, you say, okay, I want five bucks, you need to take five bucks out. Uh, Bitcoin in general, if all of us in here had a Bitcoin wallet and I wanted to send to, let's say, that guy over there, um, I'd send that transaction out and the majority of people in the room would have to actually have to actually say this is a valid transaction for it to go through. Um, if that guy and that guy go offline, that transaction will still go through, hence the concept of the decentralization. Um, mathematically linked. Uh, this actually took me a couple of years to actually just get the general gist of it. I've been involved since, with, uh, since about 2009 with uh, dealing with Bitcoin, but really trying to explain it in a non-technical fashion has been kind of confusing even for me. So uh, the gist of it is there are 20 million total Bitcoins that will be distributed and they need to figure out how do we distribute these. So they came up with this method where we can all take our computers and compete to solve uh, the calculation mathematically. Whoever solves it first gets those Bitcoins. Um, now what's to stop um, you know, your eye to say, okay, well, we're on block 200 of Bitcoins. What's stopping me from saying I own block 300? Well, basically, in short, you can't find block 300 until block 299 has been found, until block 298, 297, and henceforth. So um, that's how we secure it so people can't just go in and generate fake money. So you'd be surprised how often people ask these questions. So, um, And lastly, there are literally hundreds of Bitcoins. Or excuse me, Bitcoins. There are literally hundreds of different digital currencies. Um, so you guys have probably heard of Litecoin or Doggycoin, but um, just shout out from the audience, random uh, currency names that you guys have heard of. Skycoin, okay. Um, you know, there's actually something called Titty Coin. I mean, you've got like Zombie Coin. You've got ridiculous amounts of them. Um, so the point being is, how do we move these things around? We all know that. Well, most of us, if you've got bitcoins, know that you can go someplace and give somebody U.S. dollars or Australian dollars and get a bitcoin. But how do I get a Zombie Coin? That's where these digital exchanges come into play. So. The idea is you buy a Bitcoin or something or you mine it and then you take it to a digital exchange and you can convert it back and forth. And this has actually become so lucrative that people actually do this for day trading. There's people that actually don't mine, but they should trade back and forth to make money. Um, and then that's where things start getting really crazy because you thought drama was bad, you know, at your work or some other places. I've never seen drama anywhere like I've seen in the cryptocurrency world. It's insane. So anyways, we get back into digital exchanges. That's pretty much where Crypto Rush comes into play. So, um, as I was saying with drama, there's a lot of people involved, and I wanted to give you guys a quick run through of some of these people and you know their involvement. Uh, so, first and foremost, we come into Lincoln Zelda. He's the guy that pretty much dreamed up Crypto Rush back in early January, and he's a young guy. I'm not sure if he's still going to college or not out in uh, uh, over in Europe. Next, Deviant Two came in on board. Well, not next, but he's when I started getting involved with him, he was kind of like the second hand man that was helping LinkedIn Zelda run Crypto Rush. Then we've got Interdepth, uh, Doggy McDoggy, and Alex123. Those three guys also helped more of like support to run the original Crypto Rush. Is anybody in here who fire sticking? Okay, good, okay. This guy is insane. Um, he's known as more of like an internet persona of somebody that people listen to and they say, oh, you should buy this, sell this. And he comes up with a lot of um, these claims about, oh, we're gonna make lots of money. Pretty much everything that he touches, pretty much crashes and burns. He's scammed so many people 
it's ridiculous. And he's been actually confronted about it, and then he just screams and yells about, how dare people call me a scammer, this and that. It's just, it's just ridiculous. So be forewarned. And the weird thing is, after all this stuff has happened, people still listen to the guy. I don't know what's happened in the past month or two, but I really hope that this guy just disappears off the face of the earth. So, uh, Sigma. He was somebody that came in to kind of sort of take over as a new owner after Lincoln Zelda. Uh, basically felt it was too much for him. We have Hacker1 from the Philippines, and then we have Hacker2 from the Ukraine. Um, then we have me, who is actually now officially legally the owner signed document of Crypto Rush. So we've taken over. Everybody from the old house is gone. Uh, Xenox, awesome guy. He's somewhere in the Netherlands that um, he helps us a lot with system administration, maintenance, and making sure we keep the servers up and running. Uh, we've got GMAS, guy in South America. He actually works at doing, doing securities with banks, uh, airlines, and I've never seen a person that can lock down a computer system like this guy. Uh, we've got JCJR2, or yeah, JCJR222. Uh, right now, he's more or less the head of our support right now. Um, he talks to people so I don't have to because I get so sick and tired of answering the same question about where's my bitcoins that I'd probably just really get pissed off and rip their heads off. So he's the nice guy that uh, basically handles that for me. Uh, Broke Tech, he acts as our kind of backup um, IT tech guy. So this more or less is the players that we're going to kind of hear are really involved with Crypto Rush right now. Link and I sat down and made this timeline. There's just so much information. And um, again, I'm hoping, well, I've asked that this be recorded and I've jammed so much data on here because um, I'm expecting a lot of people to go through this data later and look online and pause it or whatever because there's going to be slide or slide after like tons of data. So please just go through and look at it then. Um, just a quick timeline as we're looking over here. Um, the original launch back in January. Um, the funny thing is about six days, seven days after that, a lot of pools started getting hacked and they started dumping all their Bitcoins onto the exchange to, to quick sell them. Um, typical instability issues, um, people doing scamming stuff, uh, more pool hacks as we get to March 9th. Um, the big hack that happened that everybody more or less knew about um, was actually on March 11th. Um, Fire sticking basically started coming on the picture March 15th. He came up with the idea of these crypto rush shares. Um, they finally created a new Bitcoin wallet that was supposed to be more secure and wasn't publicly launched or released. Um, with black coin craziness happened. Basically, in short, black coin had a problem with their wallet that when the exchange um, used it, it made it inflated everybody's uh, balances astronomically. People saw that and they started just withdrawing all this black coin. So the exchange lost all this money because it said they had all this uh, all these black coins in their account when they really didn't. So that is when, uh, actually the day after that, is when Doggy McDoggy released this uh, document which pretty much made the entire world panic about the fact that Crypto Rush had been hacked, they'd lost all this money, and he felt that they were being unethical and all these things as, as far as they handle things. Uh, pretty much at that point, Lincoln Zelda resigned and unofficially turned things over to Firestickin. Crazy thing is, He's got ownership of it, access to the system. They're literally, Lincoln uh, Deviant are literally watching Firestick and going in and stealing money right out of people's accounts. This is a guy that's saying he's upstanding morally and ethically. There are logs, there are IRC chats of talking to this guy as he's taking it right out in there. Um, at the same time, all right, who here has heard of Moolah? Okay, two people. How about um, uh, Mintpal? Okay, same guys, okay. All right, so Moolah is another internet sensation guy that uh, is really known in the crypto world. Um, a lot of people kind of follow him. Speaking of which, I've got some interesting information for you guys about Moolah. Uh, in short, he was in talks with Lincoln Zelda to buy uh, Crypto Rush from him and got pissed off because Lincoln Zelda didn't want to. As a result, he starts going on this crusade to basically destroy Lincoln Zelda, including doxing him, giving out his personal information, his home address, and all this information about him. He felt so threatened, he basically moved to a new home and all this stuff over in Europe. And it was just, uh, kind of sucked. So um, at that point, we went for a short period of just really confusion. This guy came out of the blue called Sigma. I still don't know much of anything about this guy. I think he's someplace in uh, Arizona claiming to like have an MBA and he was supposed to take over the business. I saw this guy do stuff that uh, would think this guy doesn't even have like a high school education. But didn't worry about it too much. Um, he was in the loop of stuff for a while. 
April 7 or April 11th, we had um, a third hack happen. At that point, um, the systems got shut down, and uh, we tried to figure out what was going on because obviously there were some serious serious problems here. So during this interim period, Firestick in all this time is claiming that he still owner has ownership of this of this exchange. Um, spouting all this stuff of, why are you following these false guys? You know, yada, 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 this and that. He messages Xenox, and after some heated exchange, one day he basically just goes, if you can't win, nobody's going to win, and just goes silent. It was actually kind of creepy because during this whole time period, we're hearing so much shouting from different people and all this, it was really hard to know who's doing what, who's this person over here. This could be somebody that's actually pretending to be somebody else. There was just so much... Uh, uh, Uncertainty, you're kind of going, this is creepy. This guy's been shouting at us for weeks, and then suddenly he goes quiet. On that day of April 18th, um, people suddenly started reporting uh, that they couldn't get balances or servers were going offline, and we're figuring out what the hell is going on here. And during the midst of this, Xenax just gets a casual message from Firestick and going, hey, how's it going? And that's it. Like Everything was fine and all this, and that's really making us freak out because we're going, something's really not right here. So after all the dust settled, um, we noticed that um, the old system was actually using, um, oh gosh, what is it, um, droplets, which are part of, I forget, what, Ocean or something. I forget the exact name of the company, but DigitalOcean, thank you very much. So um, they're using DigitalOcean to host all the wallet servers. Well, I love Link, but what he forgot to do is when the people started taking over, when you change your password or update your account information, it sends you an email to say, click, OK, this update of information is OK, and it will then update the password information and all that. He didn't do that. What happened is Firestickin gave the username and password that he had been given when he had first given, been given control to some script kitty, told him to go in, take over the servers, change the password, and uh, act like this guy was like the savior. Because around the same time, what tri tipped us off that something was wrong is, this guy came into the channel is talking about, oh, I've got the wallets now. I'm saving you guys from these, you know, these thieves, this and that. And it just turns out that this fire sticking guy was basically playing sides to pretend that, uh, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. So after that, Sigma steps down. I end up taking over because nothing was happening. Um, from that point, pretty much did a re entire recode of the site. Nothing is the same from before. Um, we finally got to the point where we got the public beta open. The biggest complaint that people had was that uh, the UI kind of sucked. So what we did is, um, you know, I hired a developer to basically make things look pretty because I'm some guy who makes something look good, not, um, or excuse me, I'm the guy who makes something run, not the guy who necessarily makes it look good. So, um, and then finally, around September 17th, uh, we were able to start um, crediting people their balances from the old coins that basically got stolen. So now that we've gone through the back history, let's get to the good stuff. First hack, we estimate cost us about 200 bitcoins. Second was about 1800 or 800. Third was about 400. Totaling, we lost about 1400 bitcoins. Good news is we know a little bit about something about these guys. So I, let's take over their attack nodes, track those down. We're able to grab their access logs and figure out how they um, transfer the data out. That led us to the point that, oh, we can see all their bounce servers that they're getting around to everything else. So we figured, oh, we're at it. Why don't we take those over, too? Um, that led us to finding a lot of the personal accounts and some of the accounts that they use elsewhere in the real world, leading to a lot of sites that they use. Found their personal information and their behavior patterns. Let's not forget the fact they also we also found the pictures, too. So we literally have evidence of what they look like, who they are, and all this. So let's start with hacker number one from uh, uh, from the Philippines, Jimmy Bluey Amatong. This is a URL to the link to find this actual image. This is taken from his Elance profile. Um, he basically claims to be you know a developer and does work through there. He's responsible basically for the first and third attack. Um, what we noticed with the first attack was it was slow and planned. Uh, Link had noticed in the very beginning since January that there was a slow trickle of money coming out. 
uh, but they figured there was just something weird and they just chalked it up to nothing since it was these small amounts. Um, so this guy basically what he's doing is just taking little bits over time and really not really alerting anything or everybody. What happened is our attacker, hacker number two, came in, took this huge withdrawal out. That freaked our um, uh, Philip, uh, basically Jimmy out, and he basically tried to rip everything else out at that point so that we would consider that uh, hack number three. Like I said, he fences himself as a software developer on Elance. And um, this is where we start getting into the kind of the heavy stuff about him. Um, first thing we did is uh, we found that uh, he kind of, we, we think he got into like a dormant backup server. Um, we also think that the way he's able to find that information um, was, uh, in fact, once he found that server, he also found out that CryptoRush, unfortunately, the old version, they're actually using a universal password uh, that they were able to use to basically get in at that point. Um, what we found out is that he was hired back in October of 2013 by a redacted individual via Elance. He used that server for a while, but then decided, we'll keep that FTP login information for later use. Well, it turns out they went after CryptoRush, Multipool, and several other sites that we found as a result of the logs on the server. It's ridiculous, the stuff we found. So, um, even better, we were able to find what his Elance account was and got his contact information. Home address, phone number, uh, email addresses, everything. That's a link to the particular image, which I'll show you guys later. It gets even better. You can tell these guys are not professionals. Turns out he uses his aunt's PayPal account to receive money from Elance payments. Uh, we also found that this links hit this PayPal account comes up repeatedly in different places. Some of the evidence that kind of helps us correlate that this was the guy and you know all the servers was we started finding uh, curl uh, logs where he was actually sending these wallets and uploading them to the server that he'd been given access to by Elance. So we started seeing this chain of events. So we started seeing, all right, this curl uh, command is uploading the wallet. It's going to hear who owns the server and then who owned the server. So again, once we got on there, we started seeing FTP logs of people that were passing information, uh, or after the files were, or the, the wallets were getting uploaded, we saw that, um, uh, we saw who was then downloading them via FTP at that point. So that gave us our next jump point to find out who he was. FTP log, right. Um, another thing that helps us correlate this is we had the logs of his work that he did on the Elance and the timestamps of when he was uploading his work and making his changes. That IP address also correlated with the same IPs that were later used to do the FTP downloads of the stolen wallets. Um, so as time passed again, he was just using this as kind of like a storage point to hold all this data in him. And um, funny thing is, who's heard of Midas coin or Midas pool? So this is another uh, coin that came out. They're actually really hush-hush, and more recently, their developer has actually disappeared, and um, he stole apparently a lot of the coins. Well, they found out that apparently they got hacked too. So whether that was a result of the fact that the guy just disappeared, I don't know. Not the same person, though, I know. So um, We also saw that uh, they were going after multi-pool, and we saw that their, their attack script that we were using. I don't know at what point if that's still in effect or if multi-pool is taking in care of this, um, but they definitely have some issues, and I don't know about you guys, but last I heard, they've never announced that they got hacked. So um, We also noticed he's still using the server. At the time, we found this on September 7th, or September 19th of this year, still have access logs that recently. So this is still an active service server he was using. This was before we started contacting him directly, so who knows how much has changed at that point. So good news too is the Elance customer, they were contacted and they've got all the evidence on their system. They contacted, uh, they're considering, you know, basically contacting authorities. Best of luck to them. We did the same, different issue in them, but didn't have much success there for us. So. What is it that most criminals do that get themselves caught? Leave a money trail. Close. Okay, so um, here's a great picture of our buddy Jimmy buying a truck right off the loading docks in the Philippines. They're zoomed in for you a little bit better so you can see the license plate, temporary license plate, and the dude's face. 
But all right, we need a little bit more evidence. If, I, if, if I'm you, I'm going to want a little bit more evidence to corroborate that this is the dude we're looking for, right? So, oh, OK, all right, I've got an invoice of him boasting to the internet that I just bought a brand new truck. Um, and I've highlighted this, where did my thing go? There we go, all right. I've highlighted this a little bit for you. What we're seeing right here in the bottom right here is the color of the car is cool white, and the plate number is the same that matches up here on the left. He paid cash for this Ford truck. The dude looks like he's gotta be like 18. I don't know how he came up with enough money to buy a car, truck in cash. Uh, we've got his, his name here, his address, and oh, we also see Jay Bluey here. Welcome back, Jay Bluey and Otaku Streamers. We'll get to that too. So, don't worry though, since this is hard to read, because this is that picture I was telling you about earlier from the Elance invoice that shows the exact same name, his address, Philippines phone number, personal email, and his Elance account. This is getting kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's like not even any effort at this point. So, so for your reference, if anybody's taking pictures or wants this, these are the direct links to those photos that I just showed you guys. So we got more. So we noticed pretty much as soon as this happened, he started stopped contacting all the majority of his friends and he started boasting on the internet about he'd made a fortune, you know, with bitcoins and investing really well. Um, he actually also started doing something as far as like um, saying, show, posting pictures uh, to corroborate his story by showing all this mining equipment. Um, you know, basically all these details. Unfortunately, they disappeared. And uh, I'm not sure if there'd really be a good way for us to show the, the correlation in that regard to him. He also moved his family out of his old address to a new address. And he helped his father start a tech firm. So that's the website for it. Um, you can find him on Facebook and the father's number. <laughs> when he was contacted, apparently he started screaming about, you know, and that his son wasn't a thief. Well, I don't know about you, but I hope your fathers would do that if you ever did something stupid and they contacted him. I think my father would be like, you know, smacking me or something, so. All right, so um, let's go back to Otaku Streamers. I hope nobody in here has used their site or any of their associated sites. Apparently, Jimmy runs osddl.com, os-tan.com, um, otaku, otakustreamers.com. In short, they've got about, like I said, about uh, 166,000 users. He decided to backdoor all the software. So when you log in, it's actually storing your passwords in clear text in a flat file. We may or may, may not actually have seen this directly to prove this. This isn't actually hearsay. So please tell your friends not to, you know, I don't know. I guess at this point they're screwed. But yeah. So OK, so if you would like to find Jimmy for any reason to ask him where your stolen funds are, um, here's some contact information to help you in your search. He goes by jmackey11 or jmackey as well as jbluey. We may have accidentally disconnected his home and inter uh, his, his home phone, uh, phone numbers, and internet for research purposes. Um, this is a common email address that he is using around the net for his accounts, because you know, because we all use different emails for all of our accounts, right? You know. And lastly, unfortunately, his aunt is not an innocent victim here. Apparently, she actually has a public criminal record of going and frauding local companies in the Philippines as well. We found out that she had register IP ranges with Aaron under the same email that was used on the Elance invoices. I mean, this is just ridiculous. I mean, I, I don't know, if, if, if I were you were doing this, I think we'd use a little bit more intelligence with this. I mean, this is just almost like sad, you know? So well, let's lay off Jimmy a bit. Let's go to hacker number two. We've got uh, Anton from the Ukraine. Turns out he was the guy that was responsible for the second attack that happened on, uh, what did we say? I think it was uh, March 11th. And that's what really caused a big panic where fire sticking started coming in. In short, first about information we could find was his username that he used on, on the site. It was actually his Pendolf 2008. A quick search for that revealed uh, this PDF article for a, um, uh, oh, what do you call it, for a university. And this is the direct link if you want to actually grab that PDF to get more of that details. Um, and also, by the way, I, I know I'm giving you guys a lot of links and stuff like that to check out later. Um, the guys told me that within about two hours or so, hopefully three, this entire, all this information will be on the net so you guys can pause, grab that data and whatever. So 
If that's hard to read, um, I'll put this up here for you guys. So it's Pendolf2008, it's the guy's username. Um, that's the university address in his personal email address. He is responsible for about 800 bitcoins being stolen. Called him. As soon as bitcoins was mentioned, he immediately hung up. Called back, and we get an angry screaming mother. So it's good to know that all of our, you know, uh, criminals live at home and they have their parents' protection. So, you know, it's ridiculous. So basically, at um, after attack two happened, this is kind of when the whole thing with fire sticking started coming in. And they realized that at that point they were in debt, something like 900 bitcoins that they had to get their users back. Um, they came up with this brilliant idea to create um, um, these things called crypto rush shares. You can, uh, you can, <clears throat> you and I can think of these more or less kind of like stocks. And the idea was, all right, well, let's just push these out for the public to buy them, and we can make quick gains on our money. So I think they made like 100 million of these and pushed them out to people. Um, Fire sticking was supposed to come in and be like the savior, claiming that he had bought like 50 to 60 percent of these, um, which would have been, I think, close to eight. Uh, I'm just guesstimating here, but it should have been close to like between 600 to 800 bitcoins. But in reality, he only bought like maybe 10 percent of these. So the entire thing was a fraud and a scam to begin with. Um, now, we've actually turned that since to be kind of like, all right, if you still own them, we'll still honor them. Um, and the idea behind them, too, is as the exchange makes money, percentage of those profits get paid back to uh, people who own crypto rush shares. So it's kind of like uh, it, it was intentionally kind of meant to be a quick scam, but then we were kind of turning it around to be something that people will still use um, so they don't feel like they got ripped off. So getting more into the details of the second hack, um, collaborating that this is the guy that we're looking for. Um, this is the IP address that we found um, that was used for the attack. We've got the direct get requests um, the request, the get request for the git repository information. The second hack, unfortunately, was a result of somebody posting, um, all right, so who in here is familiar with git? Okay, so I won't have to explain too much, but the gist of it is they put their git source code repository on the same production server. Uh, it's just, gosh, I know, some of this stuff is just ridiculous, but they were able to download that, use that to then leverage and grab the entire repository, find all the passwords, and get into it. After they did that, we found that they're, they're trying to actually directly go after the MySQL database. So we see that, same IP address, same more correlation. Lastly, and unfortunately, we see our attacker from the same IP address using the crypto password, default password for all the sites, and getting SSH access to the server. At that point, it's pretty much game over. So that's where the second attack came into place. Um, whole bunch of information for you guys to go through if you want more details. One of the biggest problems that we found as we're transitioning from the old crew to the new crew is that people are still accusing the old crew, uh, or excuse me, the new crew of being in cahoots or associated with the old guys. Um, so, as well as lots of rumors. So the idea here is that if you guys are actually really interested in finding out more of the backstory, reading some of the conversations and finding out some of the, uh, the, the true drama, these are a lot of links for you. So um, the long story at the top, we call that. Um, third one down is when fire sticking. Uh, it's either the third one or, yeah, I think it's the third link down. Shows fire sticking going after the black coin developers and basically threatening them death with their lives. I'm thinking, wow, dude, this is really not very professional, you know. Um, so just shows you a bit more about what's kind of happening behind the scenes, the, the original manipulation plan uh, with fire, sis, uh, fire sticking. Um, further down, this is an interesting read when he's basically accused of, um, he's basically accused of um, being a scammer. He basically again flips out again. So, ah, great stuff. So, um, <laughs> and then general, right after things started going crazy, the, the, the general log, I think, saved it. Pertinent bits of information are around like uh, line 512 on there. So, so side tangent. We'll come back. Other exchanges, because we know all these exchanges are secure, right? So MintPal has been hacked. Uh, Cryptsy is supposedly have been hacked, but they've never really officially announced anything. You've got uh, these exchanges popping left and right, and in short, what it comes down to is you've got people doing stuff that really 
they mean well, but they just don't have the professional skill or the know-how to know what they're doing. So I'm going to boast that I'm the guy who knows what he's doing since I built this whole thing from scratch and whatever. Uh, I know things aren't perfect. Um, the ideas we're always constantly refining, but when you've got people using default passwords, uh, universal accounts, just broadly across everything, you got to know that if it's happening to one or two, it's got to be happening to all of them. So the idea is just just be smart with your stuff. If you're not day trading, keep your stuff locally in your system or someplace even offline if you can. There's just so many things that people can do, and they just take for granted that they just assume they're safe because oh, I like this exchange. So. Um, Mimpel goes boom. This is actually some interesting stuff that just, this happened a, l a little while ago, but some of this information that's coming out uh, is pretty wild. So this just actually came out on the 14th um, that the moolah, this, these guys that are own all these, ex acquired all these resources, um, they're basically going under, they got to shut down, they're filing bankruptcy. Um, they also claim that they didn't take over Mimpel. Actually, yeah, on the 16th, so I guess Actually, I lost track of time. I think that's either today or yesterday. Um, that's a direct quote from this link. Funny story. This just came out. Apparently, Moolah's a scammer. They've got photos showing a uh, driver's license over in the UK of his actual identity. Apparently, he's known by four or five different names that he's used different scam things for. But it's just mind-blowing. I mean, this is just ridiculous. I mean, we think in the crypto world that... Uh, um, just because somebody's cool and, oh, yeah, this person must be who they are. But left and right, there's just so much confusion. And uh, people think you can trust this person and not that person. Um, and what it really comes down to is, unfortunately, in this crypto world, there's not a lot of people you can really trust. I mean, how many people of these people on the net have actually seen their faces before? This is actually the first time I've actually ever talked about this stuff, primarily for fear of my own life. I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard of Batcoin, but the Batcoin developer... Um, mysteriously vanished, and a couple of days later, they were showing pictures of this dude on the net, uh, on the net of him in a hospital, beaten practically to death. And there were some statements online, basically saying that, yeah, they're getting out of this completely. The sad thing is, we don't know if that actually happened, or if that was another thing where he basically just took something and disappeared again. So it's just, it's just, it's unfortunate that we don't really have a true picture idea of what's going on, primarily because this is like um, new terrain. Um, if you th Think about, let's say, our financial industry uh, from the, what, like, uh, Wall Street. Okay, so that's under so much regu like regulation and nonsense, it's kind of hard to not really be known. Um, in this world, we've only been around for maybe four years, so there's just a lot of, um, one, it's not regulated, unless you live in New York, New York, and I think it's now, like, illegal to, like, buy or sell Bitcoins unless you actually have, a, like, like, a license, which is nonsense. But then again, from the same people who like tell you you can't buy um, a pop greater than 20 ounces, or yeah, 20 ounces, you shouldn't really be that surprised, right? So my hope and my goal with all this is to actually turn this into an industry that we can actually like um, be proud of, right? I mean, a lot of people want to be anonymous, and that's fine, but you still need people that will uh, stand for something and tell the truth and not lie, as hard as that could be, you know, to be truthful about things. So I want to go what we're doing about this. The biggest thing is we're not giving up. All these other guys that have uh, been popped, they basically just throw their hands up and disappear. Everybody that I listed there from uh, Xenox, myself, GMAS, um, JCGR, we've all actually lost money with Crypto Rush. We actually came in because we saw things going down and we wanted to help out. Everybody right now that's volunteering with Crypto Rush has actually lost Bitcoins. Um, I lost about 16 Bitcoins back when they were, you know, well, we know the value and all that, yeah. Um, Lincoln Zelda, unfortunately, not only did he lose all these Bitcoins under his watch, but they actually came, they had traced that back to his home computer, and I forget the total, but he lost something like 32, 33 something Bitcoins. Um, and he's a nice guy, and it's just kind of like he's still a victim too. Um, I really feel bad for this guy. I mean, he, I think he felt like he was near suicidal because all these people were like just coming after him, accusing him of stealing and being involved in this stuff. And uh, it's unfortunate. We actually went after the law, or not went after the law enforcement, we contacted the law enforcement. Last thing expected was to be calling FBI major crimes on a Sunday morning, and then them telling me I gotta call Interpol because it's an international incident. Neither of them actually did anything. Because the server that was attacked was actually in France, that falls outside of the um, uh, this jurisdiction of the uh, FBI in the United States, um, even though us as users were actually in the United States. 
I contacted Inter I found out finally found out who I needed to contact in Interpol, which was the Washington um, uh, branch. They told me they wouldn't talk to me directly. They only deal with uh, other law enforcement agencies. I go back to the FBI and I'm like, hey, they just told me you told me to contact them, and they're telling me to contact you to tell them that I contacted them, and it's just ridiculous back and forth. But anyways, that was months ago, and still nothing's happened. So what do we do? I mean, the reason why I'm giving this information is. We can't rely on these law enforcement agencies. I'll be blunt about it, right? If you're in the side of the United States, that's fine. But in our world, it kind of comes down to us because either nobody knows what the hell they're doing or the bureaucracy ties things down. So it relies on you and I to actually make things right, you know? Um, the goal, too, is every Satoshi that was stolen needs to be paid. We believe that should be paid back. Now, if you're not familiar with the Satoshi, it's the smallest denomination of a Bitcoin that you can get is the shortest summary. It's almost like the equivalent of saying every single last penny in the digital world. So we created something called Crypto Rush Bonds. Um, with 1,400 Bitcoins stolen, there's not an easy way for uh, uh, us to just pay that back and or have that integrated with the exchange and still have daily functions. So the idea was we shifted everything that was stolen, credited them into something called Crypto Rush Bonds that won't affect the regular rest of the transactions. So if you deposit bitcoins, that stays as a bitcoin. Now what happens is these bonds, the exchange buys back as they make money. So uh, that's going to take a while, but the more people trade, the faster we'll be able to pay that back. I wanted to have it just crypto rush bonds for BTC, um, but we couldn't do that because some of the smaller denominations that were getting traded were smaller than the smallest Satoshi, so we had to create two. And the ideas are going to be paid back in a one-to-one -one ratio. We did put up a market, so if you basically are like, yeah, screw this, I don't think you guys are going to pay me back, you can dump them and sell them to other people who believe that we're actually going to make good on this. Um, yeah, just, just give people options because we get a lot of bitching. I mean, I cannot believe that the fact that we've been doing this for nearly four or five months and we still get people like coming in shouting about where's my Bitcoins when we're like putting stuff on the forums and trying to contact and let people know this stuff. Um, so... That's also why we're here, too, just to give people a lot of good information. You can actually see my face now. I wasn't actually sure I was going to be recorded, but you can actually know who I am. Well, at least my alias. But anyway, so um, we're still tracking down the culprits. We haven't stopped with what we've got so far. Um, I'm hoping, too, that you guys will also help try to find these people and ask them where your money is and maybe even take your truck back. Maybe they bought a truck for you, and now it's just waiting for you, you know? Professional team. Everybody that I brought in, they know what they're doing. It's not like some dude that sits on the forums, you know, doing nothing all day that basically now he's helping out with the site. Like I said, GMAS, he does security with banks, man. I mean, half the time we don't see him nowadays because, you know, he's working with his, you know, with like, uh, you know, shell shock and all this crap that's going on. So it's like people are, I think sometimes he finds out about this stuff before I do with some of these latest hacks, or not hacks, but exploits. So um, he's on top of his stuff. I mean, everybody's really on top of their stuff. We don't want people that are like subpar, um, but again, Nobody's really getting paid right now. We're all doing this out volunteer. I mean, it's I've, for the UI development stuff, I'm paying that out of pocket, you know? I mean, it's just, we're all just doing the best we can just trying to, like, get by. So if you feel so inclined to help us, um, if you're asking how can you help us, uh, the biggest thing for me is just getting the word out. There's just so much misinformation, and um, he said, she said, uh, I think just people hearing about this or even knowing that there's exchanges like this out will help us all tremendously. Um, time volunteering. Dude, I don't care if you guys hack the site. I mean, contact me first, you know. I mean, I'm not saying just, hey, yeah, King Dragon said one day I can go and hack a site. But, I mean, man, I, I want a secure site. If there's something that somebody missed, don't we all want to know? Isn't it going to make you feel safer using this exchange if people have actually hacked it or you hacked it and you found you couldn't get in? Um, I'm not afraid of that, you know. So, um, helping with development work. The entire coding uh, exchange engine, it's like three or four parts. I literally coded that whole freaking thing in eight weeks. I took some vacation days off from work, and it's all I did. I mean, I believe so wholeheartedly that this can come back, and this can be literally almost like the NASDAQ of the crypto, crypto rush world. Um, I mean, we can do this. There's just so much potential. It's, it's just awesome. Um, and PR and marketing. I am not a PR dude, man. I mean, I'll code the shit out of anything, but you ask me to, like, you know, sell something to somebody or say, this is awesome, look at this shiny stuff. I'm not the guy for that, man. So, um, trading. Uh, the more people trade, the faster the exchange makes money, the more people get paid back. It's as simple as that. It blows my mind that people are complaining about, don't use the exchange, you know, they stole money or this and that. And it's kind of like, you lost money here, don't you want your money back? 
let's get people using the site more so you get your money back faster. It just, to me, it just makes common sense. And it just is like a perfect storm because people that have crypto rush shares, they're getting money based on how many people use the site. So wouldn't you tell your people, hey, yeah, use this site because that gets you money. If you lost money, use the site because it gets you your money back. I mean, it just to me, it just, it makes perfect sense, you know? If you don't feel like doing either, donate, you know? I mean, uh, there's a QR code if you want to do it directly. That's our Bitcoin address. Obviously, you can track this and see how we're, we're, what we're doing with this stuff. Um, the biggest thing I wanted to do is thanks, though, to BitComSec. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of these guys, but they've been the main driving force between tracking these guys down. Um, I haven't really been able to do this because, you know, I've got a full-time job that I do. And when I'm not doing that, I'm trying to make sure that the site's getting coded and, uh, you know, up to date. So I'd love to go help tracing these guys down, but I just don't have the time. So these guys have been volunteering their time. They want to be in our digital security world, or digital currency world, um, the guys that track these guys down. Um, so they didn't ask me to do this, but I'm putting their address up there to you for, like, people to donate to. Um, and there's the QR code for that, too. Um, so I think half this data we wouldn't have on the hacks and tracing them down if it wasn't for them, if not more. Um, and then contact info, um, if you want to help kind of get more involved to you. So CryptoRush.in is the domain right now. Um, was always the original domain that we were using. IRC Freenode, you can find us on the CryptoRush channel. Um, the main CryptoRush Twitter, which people get confused without the the in there because it's actually somebody else, but it's the CryptoRush, or yeah, at the CryptoRush, and then me, uh, the One King Dragon. So my hopes and thoughts, too, are that the people that have taken stuff, if they do bring it back, we will let people know. Uh, but until then, I guess it's just a matter of tracking them down and uh, finding stuff. So I actually fired through a lot of that data quicker than I thought I would. I think it's primarily because I'm getting excited. But I'm going to leave the rest of the time to um, questions, thoughts from you guys. So I'd love to hear from you. I know that guy, and that's like, the, you know, I'll get him later. <laughs> All right, so the question was, how many of these Bitcoins are, vi or not Bitcoins, how many of these currencies are viable? Um, Bitcoin's been around for a while, and what's the longevity or life of them? Is that just, just it? Um, that's a really good question. Um, what I found with a lot of these coins is some of them are clones. So, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of these. I think Doggy Coin was a direct clone of Litecoin originally, but you have all these sub coins that come out that all they do is basically just copy it, change the name of it, and push it out there. So a lot of it, believe it or not, is actually marketing. It's more about how cool does your coin look, and uh, will people adopt to it? So a lot of developers will come along, make a new coin, push it. Yeah, this is the latest awesome thing. It gets pumped up in value. They dump all their stuff, and then uh, they make a fortune. So they actually call it pumping and dumping. There are a lot of coins that come out, too, that they're actually trying to be revolutionary. Like, uh, I think it's black coin or, no, I think it's dark coin. Too many coins to keep them all straight. But dark coin is trying to make their transactions more anonymous. They're trying to be more cutting edge. All these currencies are trying, some of them are trying to be more innovative, while others are basically get rich quick scams for people, and then they just kind of quit out. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. So my standpoint, my hope, I'm going to take it from this standpoint. So my hope and goal is that, like I said, this becomes like the next NASDAQ of the digital currency world. Um, if regulation hits me hard, I'm going to move the headquarters to be someplace internationally that I'm not hit with a lot of regulation simply because I know that's going to cost people more money in the long run. At the same time, um, for somebody that's small right now that doesn't have a lot of resources, it's going to be crushing. If I wanted to start accepting U.S. dollars directly, it would cost me a fortune because I'd have to keep in regulations with all the, uh, the U.S. regulations. I would literally actually have to track and hold on to your personal information if I was going to take U.S. dollars. There's no way around that. So if more regulation comes in, that is a good question if it's going to hurt or help us uh, simply because... Um, What's their motives, right? Why do a lot of these, we hear a lot of times with these current regulations that the motive in guys is to, you know, stop terrorists, but it's stupid that nowadays they're calling, oh, if you use Bitcoin or own Bitcoins, you're considered a terrorist. Like, what the hell? Like, U.S. dollars aren't used for terrorist activities? Last I checked, it's mostly U.S. dollars. So now they're going to accuse us of that 
simply because they can't control it. So um, we'll have to see how things pan out. You another one? Give me a good example of where regulation gives uh, people confidence to trade. Okay, you're not insured. I'm just repeating this so everybody else can hear. So you're not afraid to use a bank because you're insured up to $200,000. Did you know that if your bank gets stolen or it goes under or whatever, there's no time limit to say when they'll pay you back your money? If you need that tomorrow, well, I mean, and what happens if the U.S. government I'm not saying it's going to, let's say the U.S. government collapses, and with that, your, your sense of security and payback uh, kind of goes with it. So, so I'm with you that I think there could be some advantage to it, but I don't know what that looks like to the point where it's not strangling people at the same time. So, Other questions? So, so when you're saying taxation, um, do you mean for using the exchange or, 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 or what, what aspect? Oh, you're talking about like, like if I'm an employee someplace and they're paying me like bitcoins, like how do we handle taxing? Okay, well, yeah, sure, good example. So. Um, so if I'm telling my employer I want to, one of, one of this is going to be is going to be bookkeeping in house, right? Um, same thing with U.S. dollars. Um, the the difference is with bitcoins you can trace them a bit better. So let's say I've got a bitcoin address that my employer says I'm going to give you your payment. It's going to go to this address. Well now there's a proof of trail that showed that X amount of bitcoin was deposited at this address, and when those tax papers maybe get sent at, up to whatever the the, uh, the feds. There's proof that that went in there and it's going out. So basically, then they can say, "All right, we saw that this much of your salary went into this account. Now we can then go and tax that, and you're liable for this much money." Yeah, the only way someone could tax something is if they actually have proof of the ownership of that person with a Bitcoin address. If I just generated a new one, they have, and there's no transactions. They have no idea where I am in the world, and you, you. You're safe and anonymous until somebody knows your identity and links it to that original address. I would argue that. Because you don't know, you can't trust that when that transaction goes through, if, if the IP, so basically when you send out a transaction, there's usually an IP address attached to that um, when that when that transaction was seen. Um, now, there's no proof that that's where your IP address is or where you're coming from. So I would say until somebody knows uh, the original ownership of that, they, they can't, they can't uh, track that back to you. Um, Darkcoin is actually trying to make it so that these transactions aren't uh, traceable. So I think they're trying to take that one step farther. So does that answer your question? I know it was kind of more about taxes. Well, all right, so regarding money laundering and perfect thing, yeah, I'd say it is, and I'm actually kind of for it because I don't think anybody has any business of what I'm doing with my money and whatever. Do nefarious activities happen all the time? Yeah, um, but at what point or at what cost do we basically start giving away our own freedoms and rights um, or, or get privacy for that? So I think that we start getting more of the ethical of how much is too much and too little and do you trust the people that are collecting that data? And <laughs> NSA. So, um, yeah. Any more thoughts, questions? Yeah. Uh, can you, Silk Road, uh, will that make or break cryptocurrencies? Honestly, I think what will make or break, all right, so the question was, uh, do I think Silk Road, uh, the fiasco that happened with that will make or break cryptocurrencies? Uh, Honestly, I think it actually has, comes down to more about the PR aspect of cryptocurrencies. They're, they're making the, the Silk Road thing turn into this thing where, oh, that's all Silk Road is, or that's all Bitcoins are used for is buying and selling, you know, slaves and drugs and all that. Well, we all know that's not what it's used for. I mean, my gosh, I can start, I can buy CPU or hard, computer hardware nowadays with it. But it's more of like this PR angle that people are trying to sell it. That's why when I say kind of like even getting the word out, us talking about it and even telling it to people is key. I mean, 
I'm going to say that the biggest problem I run into that is, you know, you tell people what Bitcoin is to try to explain it to them and their freaking eyes glaze over like, what? So it's kind of like trying to understand how to explain that to people so they get it without having to know the deeper nuances of how it work, works. So I, I think the real battle isn't necessarily um, uh, Silk Road in itself, but more of how the public views it and getting them to engage and use it more. So. Yes. Roadmap. Okay, so where do I see the roadmap for the future of crypto rush? And yeah, like you said, it's reaction, reactionary based where we, where we see things happening with different exchanges. Yep. So, all right, so my ideal goal in is this, and actually I'm glad you bring that up because one of the things that's amazed me is going through this whole crypto rush. Um, uh, fiasco is that uh, I'm noticing a shift in a transition. First, it was everybody was kind of like, yeah, yeah, we think you're going to come back. We think you're going to come back, but they're expecting like a two-second turnaround. That oh, this happened Monday. Oh, okay, why are Thursday? Aren't you up and running? Why is my money not back? So we went from that to people kind of feeling despair to things going dead quiet to then saying, hey, look, our doors are back up again, and people starting to say scam, scam, scam. Just saying, dude, look, everything that I've said is happening. You know, it's just like this document that anytime I say something, we go and do it. So this track, track record, I think, of actually when we say something and happening, I think has actually been very helpful for the future. One of the biggest things um, that I've noticed uh, getting involved in this, because when I first got involved with this, I was coming into, from the standpoint of I'll be a security consultant. Oh, yeah, hey, I'll help you guys harden up and do all this. To the From that point, under the old guard, I saw that, like, uh, um, we got all the technology fixed. Like we replaced all the hardware. It was designed architecture from the ground up with a completely new structure. We had everything going technically from that standpoint, but from the business side, they were a complete mess. So that got me up to set to the point where like, okay, I need to be more active in this. So I started going into like that more of like, I'll be that guy that's that flagship, like, all right, come on guys, let's rally everybody together, let's do stuff, to the point where we basically in short kick Sigma out. I took over because stuff wasn't happening. Once I did that, I noticed that it, it, it's just a mind shift to the fact that I'm no longer um, able to do this stuff on my own. And it's like a day by day thing where like, okay, we plan for this, we're shooting for this. And um, uh, the more support we get, it's been helping a lot. What amazed me is that even talking with people now in the real world, I don't know a better way to put it, but in the real world, I'm getting people that are like, yeah, we see where you want to take this. We want to give you the support that you need. We'll give you the, like the legal uh, backing um, we see that you've got this, this this vision, and we want to give you the resources to actually make it happen. So I've actually been talking with a guy that's looking at um, actually helping us do better marketing and PR, and actually even help help get the word out to everyday people that they can actually well either they want to invest in in, in these currency markets. Um, but we've got that going. Um, if we can get some capital, I want to hire some full time developers that will continue to just make improvements and changes in that regard. But I'm fully committed to the fact that every single person is going to get paid back. And I, I believe totally. All right, so Bitrex, they have something like um, like 1,100 Bitcoins per day pass through them. If you break that down to, I think it was like 0.1%, that's like, or maybe it's 1.1%, it's like 11 Bitcoins per day. I mean, crypto rush can be solvent insanely fast. So, I mean, there's a goal. I think it's just more of getting people on that path. And once we're solvent, I want to do lots of things, like, for example, making it more, um, gosh, I don't even know if I should be telling this to you guys because other exchanges might take this on, but I want to make it so people are more anonymous, that if you do deposits, you do stuff, there's no trace back for that. There's multiple ways people can get to stuff. I want to make it so it's this place where people can feel safe, um, that is outside the bounds and constraints of organizations dictating what information should and shouldn't be stored about people. That's the hope and dream I've got for this. I want this to be something where... Um, if someone's in a or in, in a country where um, they got to get out of there because it's collapsing, that they can they know they can rely on crypto rush to get their funds out, whether it's just temporarily to get someplace else. But I just want I see it as something that really can be this bastion for the future. So, 
I think I saw a hand in the back. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So how can you, okay, on the exchange or in your own personal wallet or what? Okay, so the question was, um, if I if I have a Bitcoin, how do I can I prove that I've got ownership for it? Um, and I think it's more of not necessarily that if it's in the exchange, it's mine, but if um, um, just if I'm selling something to I don't know, uh, I don't know I don't know if Amazon's started accepting it now, but let's say how do I prove to Amazon that I've got ownership of it? Well, it's more of like a, we kind of get into public private uh, key encryption where I've got a wallet and it says it's mine and then when I transmit it out, I'm signing it. So it's kind of like this linked signature thing. Um, but you actually have to have it, you have to have control of that wallet to send it out in an exchange. It's more of, uh, in all exchanges, there's more like this IOU that says, uh, um, you own this, it's in your account and when you want it to get sent out, it gets sent out. Inside of an exchange is kind of, for lack of a better way to put it, it's kind of a free for all. So, yeah, well I think, uh, I think we're getting pretty close to the next talk here. So thank you guys for your time and hope you have a great, have a, have a great day.